Portland, Oregon has perhaps become the Paris of the 21st century. Filled with writers, artists, photographers, theater, dance, wine and beer makers, educators, and music to rival any city. And let's not forget sidewalk cafes. One of those artists who make Portland home is Randall David Tipton, a very talented landscape painter, a gift to us from the state we all love to hate, California. Randall grew up in rapidly changing Southern California and fled as soon as he could. He was first exposed to art through encyclopedias at home, then later through a local art association. Mostly self-taught, Randall chose to live an independent lifestyle dedicated to painting rather than seeking academic training. He's always lived close to nature, and his painting vocabulary evolved as he depicted those landscapes using the philosophies of abstract expressionism and Asian traditions. Improvisation remains the guiding principle in Randall's technique, while his imagery is increasingly derived from memory. We go now in the studio to meet Randall David Tipton. Like any kid, I, I drew, right? And always liked that. And liked to paint in school, but didn't have paints, really. And then I turned into a teenager, or near teenager, and went into just a tailspin depression. And my parents were concerned. They knew I liked art, and they got me enrolled in classes, painting classes. It was at a local art center, kind of new and uh, certainly out of their experience. But it was great. I was nurtured by lots of really caring adults. Um, and I've been painting ever since. I had one year of community college and somebody said to me, you should try to get a scholarship at an art school. So I did, thought I had it, arrived at school and I did not. So I liked the area in Northern California. I stayed for just one semester at the school and then I moved to a communal farm at 19, and that probably was one of the most important uh, events in my life. It was all women except me, and they taught me a lot. And I've just painted on my own pretty much since then. And that's why I'm not the most confident teacher. I'm not real sure what good teaching is. I was teaching a couple years ago, and one of my students said that two of her paintings had won awards and that she had done them in my class, which <laughs> most competitions, they say no student work, but she entered them. And they were well received, so that made me feel good. But I don't care that much for teaching because I get too anxious. I'd rather paint. I painted all the time, pissed off the women who wanted me out in the garden being social and getting work done. And I said, I'll come out when the light starts to fail and at dusk, which I did. I was there a little over a year, which was enough. I had left home, I had done something kind of brave, made friends, um, learned a whole lot from these very sophisticated women. This is 1973 and the women's movement is in full force. And, I remember that. Yeah. And, uh, I, it really shaped me, and I'm still very close to one of the ladies there. We've known each other for over 40 years. When I was a kid, I was really impressed with the Asian aesthetic, particularly from Japan, the, the Zen-influenced 
sensibility, the off-center things, the lots of empty space. But as I got older, I learned more about American painting and the abstract expressionists. They just seemed like they were on to something. And they are my major influence. And they believe that it's through improvisation, through a lack of preparation, something more personal comes through. What artists influenced you? Oh, de Kooning, uh, Mark Rothko, Philip Guston, you know, the biggies. And, and what appealed to me wasn't their subject as much as anything, it was her, their attitude. That's what got my attention. The fact that you, you really could just get in there and paint and you didn't have to have a whole lot of preconceived notions. What do you think of Picasso's work? I remember seeing a, a, a drawing of his that he did like at six or something of, of a dove. It's just gorgeous and it's got all this feeling to it. Yeah, he's, he's different. Um, the, the American painters I'm thinking of <clears throat> probably could have done a realistic drawing if they ever wanted to, but they were after something that had more psychological quality to it. They were very interested in myth, and from the Surrealists came the idea of uh, chance, using chance in the work. So they would get in there and just start slinging paint, some of them, like de Kooning. Others had a more meditative sort of image in mind, like Rothko, Barnett Newman, those kind of people. Rothko's paintings have always been described as religious. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he didn't discourage that either. Though I don't think he was religious himself. I mean, he designed that chapel in Houston at Rice University. Then lived in Portland for a while. Do you consider your style abstract? No, it isn't. And, and I often get in arguments with people who say it's very abstract, and I suppose it is in a sense, but the abstraction happens as a way to get to some kind of truth about the subject, which is the landscape. I distort or have unusual compositions because I'm trying to get across an aspect of the landscape that was important to me. I've always painted landscapes because I like to be outdoors a lot in beauty. <clears throat> but I love animals too and I keep thinking, geez, I gotta get that in before I die. Do some do an elephant at least. I mean <laughs> what I tend to do more often than not is begin a work on paper in watercolor and soon get frustrated and call in the acrylics and fix it, or at least have more options. To do it right over the... the yeah, yeah, oh yeah, mix it right in. But sometimes I'm not sure whether to throw in the towel yet or not. <laughs> but I'm getting close. The towel, the original idea. Oh. Yeah, and painters often are talking about like what well, the idea is. You, you have an idea, um, <laughs> you do your best, and then something happens in the painting that just requires you to do something different. And, and you're foolish to ignore that. Now, Having said that, what I think is kind of miraculous, because it happens frequently, is that for a while the painting will look completely different, but somehow it gets back to the original subject at some point. Really? Yeah, and it isn't even intentional. But there's something about the original marks that kind of keep the subject hovering in the background.
I've done a lot of demonstrations in the last few years. And by and large, for the most part, they have turned out really well, which has just surprised the hell out of me because I'm so distracted. And, you know, trying to give people enough information because they made the effort to come and all that stuff. I have a friend who says that when you've been painting a while, a lot of it is kind of like muscle memory. It's, it's something that I've um, never really wrestled with, though I know a lot of people do. They always talk about self-discipline and stuff. And My feeling has been when you have a subject or technique or practice or something that's working for you, that's enjoyable, it isn't hard to paint. I mean, you want to be doing it. That's how you know you're doing something authentic. Now within that, you know, there's all the anxieties about failure and stuff, and I sure have those. So starting a new painting is actually the hardest part for me because there's, you know, the chance of being discovered as a fraud. They'll see it at last. Now, Richard Diebenkorn, my teacher or mentor for a while there, uh, he suffered, oh my God. He, he would agonize about, you know, really small parts of his painting. It was just, he was obsessed. And uh, boy, once I'm underway, I, I kind of am too. I always have to finish the demonstration even though you know, I should be doing something else because um, I have a show or something. Richard Diebenkorn is as admired a painter as there was, ever was. And he, he just, he was shy. He had lots of self-doubts. Now, the important thing is just continuing in spite of all this stuff. Well, thanks, Randall, for sharing this time in your studio with us. It's been a real pleasure to watch you work. Much more of Randall's wonderful landscapes can be seen on his website at www.randalldavidtipton.com. I'm Eddie Greenlee, thanking you on behalf of In the Studio with Eddie Greenlee, and we'll see you again.